So World War I officially began in 1914 and lasted until 1918. Late 19th and early 20th century innovations in technology and manufacturing resulted in the first truly modern war. New mass-produced technologies designed specifically for killing, including machine guns, flamethrowers, tanks, submarines, fighter aircrafts, and poison gases, were churned out at an astonishing rate, resulting in the most brutal and costly war in human history at that time. On the Western Front in 1916 alone, more than 10 million soldiers died. Germany lost about 850,000, France 700,000, and England 400,000. On the home fronts, governments seized control over industry and labor to support war efforts, while ordinary people were subjected to food rationing, propaganda, and profiteering. So one of the first artistic movements to address the horror, carnage, and senselessness of World War I was Dada. This is a very loose, diverse movement that began first in Zurich, but quickly spread to New York, Berlin, Paris, and beyond. Dada in general rejected the established standards of what they considered to be a morally bankrupt European culture and society. They were disillusioned with societal corruption, nationalist politics, repressive social values, industrial capitalism, mass media and commercialism, and they were outraged by how thoughtlessly life was discarded in the trenches of battle. They mocked the senselessness of rational thought and modern society, and as a truly modern art movement, they also sought to question the conception of art itself. Uh, they held reason and rationality to be responsible for World War I, and they employed new anti-rational aesthetic strategies, including abstraction, collage, and the use of chance procedures. So in all, they were anti-war, anti-capitalism, anti-authority, and anti-art. Dada's true purpose was to highlight the insanity that was going on in society through intentional provocation and absurdity in hopes to destroy the existing system of logic and rationality. Even the name Dada embraces this. Allegedly chosen at random from a multilingual dictionary, the word Dada has no real or fixed meaning. In German, it means baby talk. In French, hobby horse. In Romanian or Russian, it simply means yes, yes. In the Kru African dialect, it means the tail of a sacred cow. And in other languages, it means nothing at all. Really, the nonsensical name emphasizes the movement's intentional refusal to make sense. Like many other modern art movements, Dada emphasized individuality. So once again, this was not a unified style, but rather a loose transnational group of artists who rejected social, political, and artistic convention, and instead embraced irrationality, imagination, chance, and accident, and who refused to be pinned to a singular style or medium. Dada artists sought to annihilate the conventional understanding of art as something precious, and replace it with a strange and irrational art focused on ideas and actions rather than objects. Neutral Switzerland became a haven for avant-garde from across Europe who were disgusted with or seeking asylum after World War I began. Hugo Ball, a German poet, and his companion Emmy Hennings, a nightclub singer, moved to Zurich, Switzerland, where they opened the Cabaret Voltaire in 1916, a nightclub that quickly became a meeting place for avant-garde artists and writers from across Europe, and it was here that Dada first emerged. The Cabaret Voltaire saw chaotic live performances that included strange, nonsensical narratives and poems, contradictory manifestos, dancing to music without rhythm, and silly skits. Hugo Ball created what he called sound poems, strings of nonsensical sounds which he claimed renounced the language devastated and made possible by journalism, and mocked the traditional poetry. When performed, Ball intentionally abandoned the rationality of adult human language and society and created new, incomprehensible languages of random sounds that sometimes sounded like baby talk and other times like animals howling and more. 
Um, his performance of his sound poem, his first performance, excuse me, of his sound poem titled Carawane in 1916 is considered to be one of Dada's first great moments. Uh, for this performance, which is what the photograph here is showing us, he wore a blue cardboard tube wrapped around his body and then additional blue cardboard tubes around his legs. He also wore a blue and white cardboard hat, which he called a witch doctor's hat, a golden cardboard cape that flapped when he moved his arms, and lobster-like cardboard claws or hands. If it sounds nonsensical or crazy, well, that's kind of because it was. Remember that Dada's purpose was to highlight the insanity or absurdity that was happening in society, and they really did that through absurd performances and irrational artworks. Ball and Hennings were quickly joined by a number of eccentric personalities, including the Romanian writer and performer Tristan Zara, who was instrumental in founding Dada. An artist and poet in his own right, Zara's primary contribution was publishing a number of manifestos outlining the goals of Dada and his creation of an international network of avant-garde artists who were connected primarily through the distribution and exchange of cheap, rapidly produced publications, including his own multilingual journal, which he titled Dada. His own style for both visual and poetic works relied heavily on ideas of chance, accident, spontaneity, and contradiction. He called his works cut-ups because he would take either text for a poem or an image for a drawing or print and literally cut it up into pieces and re then reassemble those pieces through chance juxtapositions. For example, he would often cut up text and draw the individual words or sounds randomly from a bag to make a poem. His experiments with automatism, or the abandonment of control over materials or elements in order to release the subconscious mind and allow it to create art without rational convention, um, this coincided with the work of other Dadaists in Zurich, particularly that of Hans Arp, who, according to his contemporaries, made this untitled collage with squares arranged according to the laws of chance um, with this automatic kind of method. Um, they claimed that he created this and other works like it by tearing papers into pieces and letting them fall to the floor and then pasting each scrap where it happened to land. Rather than ordering the page according to his own design, he ceded control to the random hand of gravity. The work is absolutely non-referential. There's no story, no picture, only torn blue and white paper. Although he was not a formal member of the movement, Marcel Duchamp was a prominent avant-garde artist who was really key to the development of Dada and modern art in general, especially in New York. Born in France, Duchamp's early paintings explore the modern trends of his contemporaries, including the Impressionists, Cezanne, Picasso and Cubism, and Futurism. One of his most important paintings, Nude Descending a Staircase No. 2, really peels away the traditional beauty of the nude figure in art to expand our perception of the human body in motion. We can clearly pick up on the cubist influences here with the muted color palette and the fragmentation of forms into overlapping geometric planes, but Duchamp has also invigorated the figure by placing those flattened fragments in about 20 sequential static positions across the canvas diagonally to sort of imply this state of perpetual dynamic motion that's much more aligned with futurist interests than cubist ones. When Duchamp presented this for an exhibition in Paris in 1912, fellow cubists on the hanging committee tried to exclude it. They may have objected to the idea of painting dynamic movement, or the unfamiliar subject of a nude on a flight of stairs, or the title written in block letters at the lower margin. When the work was finally presented at the Armory Show, which made the case for modern art to large audiences in New York in 1913, it was met with a hostile public reaction, and it cemented Duchamp's reputation as an artistic provocateur. Shortly thereafter, however, Duchamp abandoned painting entirely, claiming that it had become a mindless activity for him, and it was really during this time that he becomes closely associated with Dada ideas.
Duchamp wanted to distance himself from traditional modes of painting in an effort to emphasize the conceptual value of a work of art, rather than relying on technical or aesthetic appeal. He began to question even more deeply the conventional materials, techniques, and definitions of art, and he argued that artworks should be conceptual rather than simply perceptual, or that they should um, appeal not only to the eye, but to the mind as well. In about 1913, he began creating sculptural assemblages of found objects. That is, he collected ordinary, often manufactured objects and presented them with or without alteration as works of art. One of his first sculptural presentations of found objects was his bicycle wheel, originally created in Paris in 1913, although that first version was lost. Um, the image that we see here is a 1951 recreation that he did. Um, the work consists of the metal fork and wheel of a common bicycle rested upon an ordinary wooden stool. Now this is not static, but rather kinetic, meaning that it moves. Um, you can spin the wheel here. The overall composition sort of resembles that of a more traditional sculpture on an elevated pedestal. So the stool would kind of be the pedestal and then the wheel is sort of like the sculpture. But we have these very mundane, mass-produced, everyday objects. Duchamp often created such works as jokes or visual puns, but with the bicycle wheel, he created it for the simple pleasure of the juxtaposition of objects. Duchamp described the wheel saying, I enjoyed looking at it just as I enjoy looking at the flames dancing in a fireplace. He soon coined the term ready-made to describe works like Bicycle Wheel that transformed ordinary, mass-produced, commercially available, and often utilitarian objects into works of art. These ready-mades disrupted centuries of thinking about the artist's role as a skilled creator of original handmade objects. Instead, Duchamp argued, quote, an ordinary object could be elevated to the dignity of a work of art by the mere choice of an artist, end quote. The ready-made also defied the notion that art must be beautiful. Duchamp claimed to have chosen everyday objects based on a reaction of visual indifference, with, at the same time, a total absence for good or bad taste. So really, these ready-mades directly oppose the conventions of artistic skill, and they intentionally blur the boundaries between modern industrial life and art. In 1915, seeking escape from World War I, Duchamp left Paris for New York, bringing the Dada movement with him. He quickly became a founding member of the American Society of Independent Artists, which hosted an annual exhibition that claimed to be unjuried. Any work of art submitted with the entry fee of $6 would be accepted and exhibited. For the 1917 exhibition, Duchamp anonymously submitted his most famous ready-made, titled Fountain, which consisted of a standard porcelain urinal that he'd purchased from a local plumbing shop, turned on its side so that it was no longer functional, and signed with the pseudonym R. Mutt, a play on the manufacturer's name, J. L. Mott Ironworks, and a famous comic book character of the time named Mutt. The submission was labeled by several of the society's directors as, by no definition, a work of art, and it was promptly rejected, just as Duchamp had anticipated that it would be. Today, Fountain still remains as one of the most controversial works of art of the 20th century. It incites laughter, anger, embarrassment, and disgust by openly referring to private bathroom activities, human bodily functions, and vulnerability. Its crude, potty humor might be understood as simply shock value, but Duchamp was really aiming for more than that. With Fountain, Duchamp questions the essence of what constitutes a work of art. To what extent do the materials have to pass through the artist's hands, if at all, to be considered a work of art? He argues that objects could be mass-produced for the artist by industry, and that the artist's designation and the object's sort of human conceptualization are what make the ready-made qualify as a work of art, rather than its human making or its final appearance. He argued that the artist's ideas and choices and the resulting effect that those have on the viewer's mind are the most significant aspects of an artwork. 
After Fountain was rejected, Duchamp resigned from the Society of Independent Artists in mock, shock, and horror. Around the same time, an unsigned editorial published in a Dada journal, which is generally believed to have been written by Duchamp himself, described the R. Mutt case. Um, I'm only going to read part of this here, but um, he says, Whether Mr. Mutt, with his own hands, made the fountain or not, has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life, placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, and created a new thought for that object. In about 1918 to 1919, Duchamp returned to Paris, where he immediately challenged the French art world with his modified ready-made titled L-H-O-O-Q, inspired by contemporary events. So in 1911, an Italian employee at the Louvre Museum in Paris had stolen Leonardo da Vinci's well-known Mona Lisa, believing that it should be returned to Italy. By the time it was recovered in 1913, the media frenzy surrounding the scandal had caused Mona Lisa's fame to skyrocket. People had flocked to stare at its empty space on the wall, and it was widely and quite badly reproduced in postcards, posters, and advertising. Duchamp chose to comment on the nature of fame and the degraded image of the Mona Lisa by purchasing a cheap postcard reproduction, on which he doodled a mustache and goatee on the subject's famously mysterious expression, openly mocking it as a cultural artifact and subverting gender norms. Across the bottom of the card, he wrote the letters L-H-O-O-Q, which, when read aloud in French, sort of sounds like a French slang phrase that translates politely to she's hot for it, or slightly less politely to she has a hot ass. So he's taken this already badly reproduced, cheapened image and sort of cheapened it further with a crude sexual innuendo. But again, like with Fountain and really all of his ready-mades, he's focusing on his idea and his choices rather than the process of making or the final appearance and challenging traditional notions about what constitutes art. But he's also challenging moral and societal conventions by making ridicule, bodily functions, and differences his central artistic content. In 1918, Club Dada was founded in Berlin, where the movement took its most overtly political form, shaped by a disillusionment with the harsh post-war climate of Germany. After the end of World War I, the nationalist German Empire had been replaced with a federal government known as the Weimar Republic, who had quickly signed the Treaty of Versailles, accepting all blame for the war and agreeing to pay reparations, resulting in a highly inflated German economy, public dissent, and political tensions that the new republic just wasn't prepared to deal with. Berlin Dada produced more visual art than most other literary-oriented groups, like those in Zurich. They used abstraction, collage, assemblage, ready-mades, and performance, and incorporated elements of propaganda and mass media, as well as themes of humor, nihilism, chance, and intuition to create poignant works that satirize society and convey strong political messages. Kurt Schwitters, for example, used fragments of commonplace items directly from life, such as used ticket stubs, fragments of newspapers, postage stamps, ration coupons, beer labels, and other street trash, combined with painted or drawn images to create both two- and three-dimensional works of visual poetry, which he called Merzbilder, which is German for refuse or trash pictures. He wrote that garbage demanded equal rights with painting. In this 1919 collage, Mersbild number 5B, Picture Red Heart Church, it includes newspaper scraps and street trash to comment on the disorder within Germany at the time. Um, it includes one newspaper clipping that discussed the brutal overthrow of a short-lived socialist republic in Bremen. Visually, the composition recalls cubism with its sharp, angular, fragmented, overlapping forms and muted color palette, but the intense political charge that is within this is quite new. 
Perhaps the most prominent art form amongst Berlin Dada was photomontage, an innovative form of collage using cut up photographs and images and text from mass media publications. Hannah Hirsch, the only female member of the Berlin Dada group, contributed greatly to the development of photomontage. Between 1916 and 1926, she worked for Ulstein Verlag, Berlin's largest publishing company at the time. She designed decorative patterns and wrote articles on crafts for women's magazines. Um, Hirsch considered herself part of the 1920s women's movement, and she disapproved of the contemporary mass media representations of women as both the targeted consumers of cheap mass-produced domestic goods and the cheap, simple, manufactured objects of consumption. Hirsch combined images and words from popular mass print media and other photographs into complex and scathing photomontage critiques of political and social issues, especially in relation to gender roles, women's rights, and the idea of the new Frau or new woman, a historical construct understood to be a young, independent, often smartly dressed woman with a short bob hairstyle, eschewing home and family life in favor of joining the workforce um, as a liberated and sort of independent being. In Weimar Germany, the new woman or new Frau was the subject of both praise and derision in Berlin's illustrated press. Her image, which appeared frequently in newspapers and magazines, became fodder for Hirsch's photomontages and their celebration of new and expanding roles for women. Hirsch, a new woman herself, fought for her place within the Berlin Dada group, despite one of the male members disparaging description of her role as merely conjuring up beer and sandwiches. One of Hirsch's best known photo montages is titled Cut with the Kitchen Knife Dada Through the Last Weimar Beer Belly Cultural Epoch in Germany. It combines images and words from the popular press, political posters, and photographs to create a complex, angry critique of Weimar Republic in 1919. She intersperses images of machinery, architecture, figures, letters, words, and phrases into a clashing, chaotic scene that is meant to reflect the turbulence of the time. Notice that the word Dada is sort of scattered throughout the composition, really highlighting the group's ideas about society. The upper right corner is sort of meant to be an anti-Dada corner, and it includes recognizable images of Weimar political figures, while the lower left or excuse me, the lower right corner is the Dada corner, and it includes portraits of Berlin Dada artists, including Hannah Hirsch herself. Um, her tiny little head is pasted kind of here-ish near, um, near to this map that she's included in kind of the lower corner, which shows um, countries where women's suffrage movements have kind of gained momentum during 1919 and 1920. Um, Dada images and text cut diagonally across the picture to the upper left, um, right about here. And we see Albert Einstein with some text just below that proclaims Dada is not an art trend. Um, to the lower left, we've got images of the masses who seem to imply a coming revolution that is being headed by an assassinated communist leader, Karl Liebknecht, who also has some text just by him that advises us to join Dada. Um, Hirsch also includes images of famous, easily recognizable women within this composition to reference modernity and liberation. Um, at the center of the composition here, we have this headless pirouetting figure of Nidhi Impikoven, a famous dancer and actress, and then above her body floats the head of Kathy Kollwitz, a famed German artist and activist and the first female professor at the Prussian Academy of Arts in 1919. I think Hirsch is perhaps using the physically fit and active dancer as a symbol of women's sexual freedoms and Kollwitz's head as a symbol for intellectual or educational achievements, but both represent women's liberation and professional success, and together they illustrate the modern woman as strong of both mind and body. 
Dada ideas, including its calls for revolution, its celebration of technology, popular culture, and the new woman, really dominate this composition, and as the title implies, cut through Weimar's beer belly cultural epoch and the figures aligned with it. It's interesting that the titular tool for this cutting is Hirsch's kitchen knife, an instrument aligned with women's work, conflating the traditional domestic role of women with the physical act of cutting up these images. Women then take on an active role in this new Dada world, moving and expressing themselves freely, working to bring on the Dada revolution. Uh, Cut with a Kitchen Knife was included in the first International Dada Fair of 1920, along with about 200 other works. Um, so here is Hannah Hirsch right here, next to her boyfriend at the time, Raoul Hausman, who was also a member of the group. And then right there on the wall behind them, you can see this photo montage. Um, now, Hirsch had to fight quite hard um, to kind of earn this spot. Um, Several of the male members wanted to exclude her from this exhibition. Um, but upon entry to this international Dada Fair in 1920, uh, viewers were really bombarded with sights, sounds, and images, including signs and slogans that read, Dada is political, or art is dead, long live the machine art of Totlin, intermingled with artworks of varying sizes and shapes hung floor to ceiling, or in the case of John Hartfield and Rudolf Schlitzer's effigy of a German officer with a pig's head hanging directly from it hung directly on the ceiling. Um, another prominent member of Berlin Dada who was dedicated to photo montage was John Hartfield. Um, Hartfield distributed his political photo montages, many of which boldly and savagely satirized Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime in mass media publications and in posters. These montages often parody Hitler's most iconic poses, gestures, and symbols to create the impression that one only need to scratch the thin surface of fascist propaganda to uncover its absurd reality. His 1936 photo montage on the left here, titled Have No Fear, He's a Vegetarian, was intended as a warning not to trust Hitler or the Nazi regime. Hitler was a self-identified vegetarian and animal lover, and while many initially saw him as a very peaceful politician, others recognized the threat that he posed. Here, Hartfield pastes Hitler's head onto the body of a butcher dressed in a bloody apron, um, and he grins maniacally while sharpening these knives and kind of looks hungrily over at this Gaelic rooster, which is a symbol of France. And in the background, we have the pro-Nazi French Prime Minister Pierre Laval kind of looking on, reassuring the rooster and his people not to worry. Um, on the right side, we have a 1932 montage titled The Meaning of the Hitler Salute, Little Man Asks for Big Gifts, which specifically links Hitler's electoral success to his courting of wealthy German industrialists. The difference in scale packs a pictorial punch, underscoring the commonplace idea that money fuels political power by implying that the Nazi salute is in fact a plea for cash. The impact of Hartfield's images was so great that they helped transform photo montage into a powerful form of mass communication, but unsurprisingly, when Hitler assumed power in January of 1933, Hartfield quickly found himself sitting at number five on the Nazis' hit list. His apartment in Berlin was raided, and he only narrowly escaped capture by jumping through the window and fleeing across the border into what was then Czechoslovakia before immigrating to Britain in 1938. Another prominent avant-garde artistic and literary movement of the early 20th century was surrealism, which sought to release the creative potential of the unconscious mind through the embrace of disorder, irrationality, chance, and absurdity. Surrealism initially emerged as an offshoot of Dada from the mind of the French poet André Breton. Breton worked in a neurological hospital during World War I where he had become interested in Sigmund Freud's theories of psychoanalysis, the analysis of the unconscious mind and dreams um, that would maybe allow us to sort of understand how irrational forces and desires motivate human behavior. And he applied these theories to um, traumatize 
U.S. soldiers. He then became active in the Dada movement in 1920 and gradually developed his theories before publishing his first Manifesto of Surrealism in 1924. He argued that the only way to cure the war-sick society of the 1920s was to uncover the more intense surreality that transcended rational constraints. Breton and the Surrealists accepted Freud's conception of the human mind as a battleground where the unconscious wages constant war against the rational, orderly, and oppressive conscious mind. They believed the rational mind repressed the power of imagination and sought to explore humanity's bo most base, irrational, and forbidden desires and instincts by freeing the conscious mind from reason. They were also quite inspired by Karl Marx, and they hoped that this unconscious freedom would also have the power to reveal the contradictions of society and spur on social revolution and reform. The Surrealists were interested in dreams and other mysteries of the subconscious, and they found a strange magical beauty in the unexpected, the uncanny, and the unconventional. These artists worked in individual, sometimes vastly different styles, in celebration of creativity, um, and societal and political freedom. Each artist relied on motifs from their own dreams and unconscious minds. Surrealist works tend to be outlandish and perplexing combinations of incongruous images, objects, and materials meant to jolt the viewer out of any comfortable or comforting assumptions. Surrealists developed several strategies for liberating the unconscious mind, including free association, automatic writing, and word games. One technique which they used was called waking dream seances. It involved putting various group members into a trance-like state that would allow them to say and do things unburdened by societal expectations. However, when one of the dreamers allegedly tried to stab another member of the group with a kitchen knife during their trance, they put a stop to this particular practice. They also developed several methods of automatism, releasing the unconscious to create the work of art without rational intervention. One of their best known techniques for producing surprising new imagery and forms was a drawing game, which they called cadaver equi, or the exquisite corpse. Players take turns drawing on a piece of paper, traditionally drawing body parts, but they don't have to always. Um, but then they fold or cover um, to conceal their contribution to the drawing before passing the paper to the next person who adds to the drawing without seeing what the first person added, and so on and so on, until you have a finished composition. And so again, this is a great way to kind of uh, produce surprising new images and forms. Max Ernst, a self-taught German artist who was involved with Dada before joining Breton's Surrealist Circle in Paris, was very interested in making processes and the idea of chance. He developed a technique of automatism called frittage in 1925, in which the artist rubs a pencil or crayon over paper that's been placed on a very textured surface. Um, Ernst then allowed the resulting images to stimulate his imagination, discovering new forms within them that he would then make clearer or add to with more drawing. He modified this technique for painting, calling it grattage, by placing a painted canvas on a textured surface and scraping paint away to reveal textured forms that he would again then enhance or add to. This 1927 work titled The Horde transforms the roughly scraped grattage texture into a nightmarish scene of monsters, perhaps inspired by the horrors of World War I. The most famous surrealist is, of course, Salvador Dali. Born in Spain, Dali trained at the Fine Art Academy in Madrid, where he mastered illusionistic representation before moving to Paris in 1928. Dali's works, which he called hand-painted dream photographs, use meticulous surrealism to depict visually convincing yet physically impossible hallucinations. André Breton invited Dali to join the Surrealists in 1929, and later described his images as, quote, the true process of thought, free from the exercise of reason and from any aesthetic or moral purpose. 
Dali incorporated recognizable forms into visual fantasies of the unconscious mind, often creating optical illusions of images with double meanings and objects and environments that melt together like a confusing dream. For example, in this 1938-39 work titled Apparition of Face and Fruit Dish on a Beach, the footed white fruit dish bearing brown-skinned pears in the center of the painting doubles as a forehead, nose, and mouth. The eyes of the face are simultaneously parts of objects lying on the beach in the background. The landscape beyond the beach turns into the profile of a dog, while the dog's collar becomes a bridge. The beach itself doubles as a tablecloth, especially where it appears to drape over an edge to the far right. Dali was quite preoccupied with abnormal psychology and the study of delusions, phobias, and nightmares. His more extreme imagery included Freudian symbols and explored sexual anxieties, death, and decay. His major contribution to surrealist theory was what he called his paranoiac critical method. He claimed to produce art by entering a self-induced state of hallucinatory delusions similar to what might be caused by a state of extreme paranoia. Um, he did this so that he could cultivate the paranoid's ability to misread, mangle, and misconstrue ordinary appearances, thus liberating himself from conventional thought and allowing himself to imagine new images which he then painted. In his 1931 work, Birth of Liquid Desires, Dali depicts a large yellow biomorphic form or an organic shape that resembles a living creature. Um, it sort of looks like maybe a hunk of Swiss cheese, a painter's palette, or maybe a monstrous face, but it serves as the backdrop for four figures. A woman in white hugs a nude figure with both breasts and a penis standing with one foot in a bowl that is being filled with liquid by a third partially hidden figure to the right, while a fourth figure stoops to enter this cave-like space to the left. Above, he includes a thick, black, cloud-like form that looks to support an open dresser from which wrinkled clothing has spilled out. This form, he said, came to him in a dream. Dali said that he painted simply what a paranoid, critical mind had dreamed up in its nightmares. Here's one more example of Dali's work, and this is probably his most famous work, um, titled Persistence of Memory from 1931. Again, he's precisely rendered a strange juxtaposition of unrelated yet recognizable forms within an illusionistic, deep landscape space that can't possibly be real. This sparse, desolate landscape is obviously surreal and firmly rooted in the artist's imagination or subconscious. A dead tree seems to sprout from this strange geometric platform with distorted clocks, a timepiece swarmed by ants, and to the right, a strange fleshy blob. However, the work also incorporates some aspects of the artist's physical reality, such as the golden cliffs in the distance, which echo the coastline of Spanish Catalonia, Dali's hometown. Dali proclaimed that he didn't know the meaning of the work. Um, though it does seem he's presented maybe the plane of his own subconscious. The clocks are widely thought to symbolize the omnipresence of time. Time is such a measured, precise, regimented thing, and it really controls society's waking hours. But in dreams and in memories, which are both in the realm of the unconscious mind, time is often distorted. Here, the hard mechanical clocks, which are all set to a different time, physically melt into these limp blobs, maybe representing that distortion. Einstein's theory of relativity, which addresses the complexities of time, was published in 1916, so potentially Dali was thinking about that. And if you notice, he's even painted this little fly on the face of the clock that's melting over the edge of the platform, creating a visual pun. Time flies. Um, this strangely melted fleshy form to the right is both alien and familiar as well. It's actually an approximation of a human face, generally thought to be a self-portrait of Dali, with um, sort of long eyelashes, a nose, and even a little bit of a curled mustache here. 
Again, Dali proclaimed that he didn't know what the meaning of this work was, and he refused to associate the clocks or any other elements with anything specific, claiming that he'd been inspired to paint this after playing with some melted cheese. He described the work as, quote, nothing more than the soft, extravagant, solitary, paranoid, critical camembert cheese of spime and space. So the Surrealists generally treated women as muses and objects of study rather than as their equals. But one of the few female artists who was invited to participate in the Surrealist group was the Swiss artist Merit Oppenheim, whose 1936 object, Luncheon in Fur, embodies the group's interests in uncanny surrealities. Oppenheim was allegedly inspired by a conversation she had with Pablo Picasso and photographer Dora Maar over lunch. She'd apparently worn a fur-lined bracelet, which prompted Picasso to claim that one could cover anything with fur, to which Oppenheim allegedly responded, even this cup and saucer. Then, when she was later invited to join the first Surrealist exhibition devoted to objects, she brought this, a porcelain teacup, saucer, and spoon covered with the fur of a Chinese gazelle. She takes the two objects, the tea setting and the fur, out of their ordinary realities and recontextualizes them into an irrational new surreality. And the result is kind of interesting because on the one hand, it's sort of luxurious and desirable, I think due to the associations of the kind of original materials. But when you combine those materials, you get this deeply unsettling juxtaposition that inspires a rather sensual reaction, even an aversion, as you think about what it might feel like to drink from this object. Now, Pablo Picasso continued his Cubist explorations after the official movement had faded, but he also incorporated other stylistic elements, including surrealist elements. In 1937, while living in Paris, Picasso was commissioned to create a large-scale painting for the Spanish Pavilion in the 1938 Paris Exposition, which was the first time Spain had had a national pavilion at any World's Fair. Picasso wasn't sure at first what he wanted to create, but while he was thinking about it, um, the Spanish Civil War between the Republicans and the Nationalists really began to escalate. Then, on April 26, 1937, Nationalists supporting German bombers attacked the Spanish city of Guernica. There was no military purpose for the attack, but for more than three hours, 25 bombers dropped around 100,000 pounds of explosives on the town, while more than 20 fighter jets gunned down anyone caught in the streets trying to flee the carnage. Fires burned in Guernica for three days, and by the end of it all, about 75% of the town's buildings had been destroyed, and a third of the town's population had been either killed or wounded. The world was shocked, but even more so when it came out that the nationalist leader of Spain, Francisco Franco, and the German commander had planned this attack merely as a training mission for the German Air Force. Picasso was absolutely horrified, and he immediately decided that for the Spanish Pavilion, he would produce a monumental history painting detailing the historic and horrific events of the attack. And so this is the result, um, his 1937 Guernica. The scene is complex, chaotic, and layered with meaning. Painted in somber black, white, and gray, the image resonates with anguish, freezing the brutality and suffering in mid-action, as if caught by the flashbulb of a reporter's camera. Broken human forms are scattered across the long canvas. Um, at the center, we have this screeching wounded horse who is trampling the soldier beneath his feet. Uh, to the left, we have this rather expressionistically rendered dazed looking bull kind of standing just behind this topless woman who's kneeling and weeping while cradling her dead child. To the right, um, we have a woman who leans out from this open window, kind of holding this oil lamp above the scene, while this man here throws his arms up in the air, seemingly trapped within this burning building. Um, at the top center, we have this um, giant light bulb that suggests an all-seeing eye. 
These images have been interpreted in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, many see the bull as a symbol of Spain, or more specifically as Franco or the nationalist faction, while the horse is often interpreted as the Republican faction. Picasso refused to acknowledge any extra symbolism, claiming that the work was about the massacred victims of the atrocity, but beyond that, the meaning was fluid. Surrealism was strong in Mexico and Latin America, as many European artists fled there during World War II, including André Breton himself. In Mexico, he met Frida Kahlo, who he claimed as a natural surrealist. Many art historians also label her as such due to her psychologically unsettling imagery, and even I have kind of grouped her with them, but she did not consider herself a surrealist, saying, quote, I never painted dreams, I painted my own reality. Kahlo suffered lifelong chronic illness and pain. She might have been born with spina bifida, a medical condition affecting the development of the spinal column, but at age six she suffered polio, which permanently damaged her right leg and caused lifelong weakness and pain. At the age of 18, she was in a bus accident in which her right leg and foot were crushed, her ribs, collarbone, and spine were broken, and her abdomen and uterus were pierced with an iron handrail. After as many as 35 surgeries and an initial three-month recovery period, she experienced lifelong pain and had to undergo several additional operations. Periodically, she wore plaster corsets to help heal her spine, and she was often confined to her bed. Her persistent medical issues and the accident impacted her fertility as well, resulting in multiple miscarriages. During her initial recovery period, her father brought her art supplies, and it was then that she began painting. She had a special easel installed that allowed her to paint from her bed, and she had a mirror hung above it that allowed her to see herself. Um, painting proved to be a rather effective outlet for representing her experiences with these physical, mental, and emotional traumas. Her artworks tend to combine relatively naturalistic depictions of her outward appearance and often graphic depictions of her chronic physical and psychological suffering with metaphorical references to her feelings, personal experiences, relationships, her mixed cultural heritage, and her own personal philosophy and sense of identity, as well as ideas of feminism and womanhood. Um, many of her works are self-portraits, and she once said, quote, I paint myself because I am so often alone and because I am the subject that I know best. In 1929, at the age of 22, Frida Kahlo married the 42-year-old Mexican muralist Diego Rivera, who was a dedicated Marxist and a member of the Communist Party. Calo painted this 1932 work titled Self-Portrait Between the Borderline of Mexico and the United States shortly after returning from traveling the United States with Rivera in 1930 and 31, during which time she had experienced her second miscarriage. In the work, she positions herself atop a stone that straddles the border between Mexico and the United States. The stone has an inscription that reads, Carmen Rivera painted her portrait, 1932. Uh, so here she's used her Christian name, Carmen, and her husband's surname. Um, she shows herself holding a Mexican flag made out of papel picado, which is a traditional Mexican art form using cut paper. Um, and then in the other hand, she holds a cigarette. To the left of the composition, we see a Mexican landscape with native plants and cacti in bloom firmly rooted in the soil. There are pre-Columbian figures and a temple in the background that reference ancient Mesoamerican heritage, but the temple is damaged, maybe alluding to cultural deterioration or perhaps more specifically to earthquakes that damaged a lot of Mexico's ancient architecture during the same year that this was painted. Um, Kahlo also includes a skull on this side, which can be interpreted as both a symbol of Mexican heritage because of its association with um, Dia de los Muertos festivals, but it also serves as a sort of memento mori or a reminder of the violence committed against native people by European colonial powers. To the right side of the composition, we see the American landscape of industry, crowded with skyscrapers and machines. All plant life has been replaced by wires and cables, and in the distance, we see the smokestacks of a Ford automobile factory emitting a cloud of smog that supports the American flag. 
beneath the border here, um, the black ribbons of electrical cords sort of meet and intertwine with the natural roots of the Mexican vegetables. Perhaps Cullo suggests that American industrialism, which her husband celebrated in many of his artworks, is infecting the rich Mexican soil. Or perhaps that the U.S. relies on Mexican labor, fertility, um, and etc. for its own material progress. In personal correspondence, however, Callot claimed that she painted this to express her own feelings of homesickness and isolation that had plagued her during her travels with Rivera. This large-scale double self-portrait from 1939, titled The Two Fridas, presents two versions of the artist, identical except for their outfits, seated on a bench framed against a stormy sky. They join hands and gaze stoically out at the viewer. The use of a double self-portrait here is interesting, and it could have several metaphorical interpretations. Perhaps the most overt connection is to the mirror that she had installed over her bed that allowed her to paint herself during recovery and bouts of illness. The double portrait also calls attention to her complex cultural identity as a woman of mixed Mexican and German Jewish heritage. Prior to her marriage to Rivera, Calo typically wore modern European fashions of the era, but he really encouraged her to embrace her Mexican heritage, and so she adopted more traditional Mexican attire. The use of two figures here really allows her to address these two distinct aspects of her identity simultaneously. Um, the Frida on the left here wears this um, contemporary European gown in white, reflecting her father's German roots and the styles that she wore in her earlier life. The Frida on the right wears a more traditional Mexican skirt and blouse, reflecting her mother's heritage and the styles that she had embraced after her marriage to Rivera. Now, as in many of her works, human anatomy is rather graphically depicted here, with the hearts of these two figures vulnerably exposed, and then the one on the left is even further ripped open. This emphasizes the sensitive emotional content of the painting, and it also references the ancient Aztec custom of human sacrifice by removing the heart. Calo often used blood as a visceral metaphor of union. The two figures here are not only holding hands, but they're further connected by this common artery that sort of stretches between their hearts. Perhaps this represents the literal mixing of Mexican and European bloodlines within her veins, or maybe it symbolizes a newfound unity between the two halves of her cultural identity. It's also significant to note that the year she painted this canvas was the same year that Frida Kahlo divorced Diego Rivera. She allegedly once told an art historian that the Mexican Frida, who was the Frida that Diego loved, and the European Frida was the one that he did not. The exposed hearts and arteries are indicative of her feelings of sadness and vulnerability at the time. On the right, the artery that wraps around the traditional Mexican Frida's arm feeds into this miniature portrait of Diego Rivera, indicating that part of her still sort of pines for her lost love. On the left, the modern Frida clamps down on the vein with hemostats, figuratively severing her connection to him and quite literally stopping the bleeding. She has been hurt, and that cannot be undone, as evidenced by the bloodstains on her white dress, sort of marring this symbolic innocence. However, she is strong, and she is resilient, and she will carry on. <laughs>